Hang on to your seats, everybody. Check this out. Let's get over on the bench and make this thing happen. GitHub is the place you want to be for open source software. And so there is a link in the description down below for this GitHub repository. This is Lynx2004 and his X6100 Armbian. Armbian is a flavor of Debian that has been pre-built for uh, ARM computers. And it directly supports the ARM processor system on a chip setup all winter thing that's going on inside the Zygu X6100. So here we are. We finally have a working Linux distribution that boots up on the X6100 natively, and the screen's not sideways. So Armbian was the way to figure that out. Let's take a look at what's going on here. There are some instructions in the readme file. There's a screenshot of what it looks like running on the radio. We'll do some more of that later on on our own. Um, need an SD card and you need an X6100 and this is instructions on how to actually build the uh, image that you put onto the X6100 so he's sharing everything with you here which is fantastic where we are with current status uh, cat control works over Wi-Fi it works locally and it works over USB-C so this is really interesting in order to get it working over USB-C, there are two USB-C ports on the side of the radio. One is a dev port, one is a host port. One is your radio acting as a USB device. The other one is your radio acting as a USB host. You see where I'm going with this? You plug the USB dev port into the USB host port and it becomes its own USB device. Pretty slick. So you can get cat control working over all three of those methods. Uh, RF audio receive only is where we're at right now. We haven't figured out how to get uh, RF audio transmit working over Wi-Fi or, or over a uh, local OS, but it will work with the USB-C connection plugged in. And then the IQ ports, eh, we don't know yet. This is still a work in progress. We're on 0.0.3, and it was just uploaded the morning of me recording this. Uh, 002 I used yesterday, didn't work as good as 003 today is going to work. We're going to keep on rolling on. It has VNC built in, so you can VNC into it from a big computer. It has no VNC, so you can use a web browser to access without any VNC client. Uh, Wi-Fi works just as good as it always did before. The problem is physical hardware limitations, not Wi-Fi software, Linux software limitations. Uh, we've got SSH running. We've got RAID control running and XRDP. Uh, which he says is untested. I did see 3389 was running. I'm like, that's ah, the RDP port. That's about as far as I get with that. Uh, information on how to get RX audio, information on how to get CAT via network, information on how to set up WSJTX, information on setting up a virtual frame buffer. The display on the 6100 is 800 by 480. It's a little small to do anything. When you open up WSJTX, the dialog box is are half off the screen. This sets up a virtual desktop so that you can move the mouse down to the lower left and the screen will kind of slide up underneath the mouse and then the button will be there. It'll make sense when you do it. It is not fun, but it is better than not being able to do it. Some more information on the build steps and then where are we going from here? How to install it onto the SD card, we'll need to do that. I'll show you how to do that how to boot it. There's a really clever thing about booting it uh, where you can push buttons on the front of the radio to get different boot settings. We'll go through that a little bit. And that is all of it. If you go up to the very top of this page, there is a button marked tags. So click on the tags button. It's, it's right there, right above all the file listing. Click on the tags button. And you'll see that uh, we've been pretty busy working on this. And we're at 0.03b as the current uh, highest version. But there could be a new one by the time you watch this video. We're moving pretty quick here. So you just want to download whichever one of these makes sense for your machine. I'm going to download a tar GZ file. I'm going to stick it on my Raspberry Pi. And then I'm going to build the SD card on the Raspberry Pi. Let's get set up over there to do that. I am in my user Pi's home directory on my Raspberry Pi. This is where I put my files. These instructions will work on any kind of Linux computer and you might be able to adapt them for a different kind of computer. This is some pretty low level stuff. I just stick with doing it on a Linux computer. I have put these files into my desktop folder because I do all my work on my desktop. 
And in my desktop folder, I have the RMBN for x 610003 b alphatarxz file. So it's XZ compressed. So we first have to un-XZ it. And that's going to take some time. Blinding speeds on a Raspberry Pi. This thing is uh, 8 minutes 46 seconds to unextract this file. Let's see what we got here. We have... <laughs> we converted the XZ file to a tar file. I kind of knew that was going to happen. Tar um, dash X F. So we want to extract from the file RMBN. And we'll be back in another eight or so minutes. All right, all right, fine. It was only six minutes and 43 seconds instead of eight minutes and 46 seconds. So it's a little faster this time. Excellent. A little less processor work, a little more disk work. My machine here is a Raspberry Pi, and the reason this has taken so long, I believe, is because I have a slow SD card. That's how they get you. What do we get for our fruits this time? We've got a desktop image, and we've got a U-boot SD card dot bin, and those are the two things that we need. All right, so next up, we need to figure out where our SD card is mounted. LS block for list block devices is showing me that SDA1 is the one that I want to write to. MMC BLK0 is the internal SD card, and SDA1 is the SD card that I have plugged into the USB to SD card adapter. So I'm going to go ahead and write to my SD card. So what I want to do is sudo dd for disk duplicator, I guess. if for input file equals armbn 25, 22. Okay, and then I just press the tab key to complete that long file name out. of equals slash dev slash sda block size equals 1024 status equals progress. And you don't need to put the status on there, but otherwise it just sits there looks, looking like it's doing nothing. And this is a huge file. Oh, I spelled dev wrong. See, that happens sometimes. So I want to put a V there where it belongs. And then we'll run it again. We gained back that extra minute that we shaved off before, so don't feel cheated. This took 9 minutes and 26 seconds. Probably not a wise choice to do it on a Pi 3B Plus at USB 2 speeds, but we're going to get this done regardless. It kind of doesn't matter. So to put the boot sector on, it's another DD command, and we want to do IF equals U-boot, which is going to be the actual boot sector, OF equals slash dev slash SDA, and we need to do BS equals 1024, and seek equals 8. And this is some magic for the way U-Boot works. So this is actually going on top of the other partition that we just wrote in a very special location that U-Boot knows to look for to find the rest of the code to go forward with. It's all dark magic to me. It just works. People smarter than me figured this stuff out. Why they made it as complicated as they did was to keep people like me from knowing what was going on. It's the only thing I can imagine. We're going to write that. This is a smaller file. I forgot sudo. Sudo, bang, bang. And we're done. Now we need to put this thing in the radio and boot it up. Okay, folks, here's where it gets interesting. This is the regular Zygu X6100. This is the SD card that I just built for you. We're going to plug this into the SD card slot, and nothing's going to happen. That's intentional. Next thing we're going to do is turn this off, and it's off. We're going to turn it back on. And again, you're going to notice that nothing has happened. And that's my favorite part about this. Nothing happens unless you ask for it to happen. This thing is always the way it was from the factory without causing any damage or any interference. So what we need to do next is we need to turn it off and we need to press some special keys when the thing boots up. These are, let's just give these numbers. One, two, three, four, five. Those are the ones that we're going to use. I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to press the two key while it's booting. All right, so it's off. Turn it on, I'll press two. And you can immediately tell something's up because the screen went wonky. And now we're booting a Linux operating system. And you've seen me do this before on the channel. What's gonna be new is what comes up after this. Look at that. That's interesting. 
It was clicking a relay while I was typing in the root password. And this is the Armbian default user and password of root and 1234. And there we go. We've got ourselves a desktop. And let me connect to Wi-Fi. And we're connected. Awesome. Next thing I want to do, this screen is awful tiny. And like I mentioned before, if I go into run WSJTX, which is under multimedia, yep, I can't hit the OK button. And now you can see the WSJTX is too big for the screen. If I go to File and I choose Settings, it's too big for the screen. There are ways to, to deal with this. I don't want to deal with it. I want to fix it. I want to make it more user friendly. So the next thing I want to do is go to a terminal program. That's right, I'm running a Linux terminal on a radio. I'm going to run the command XR. All right, and now if I exit out of here, we can scroll down to the, the far corner of the screen and we can scroll back up to the top corner of the screen. Let's do applications, multimedia, and I'll show you the difference there. I know you I know you guys saw JSA call in the menu there. Don't go getting ahead of me. And now we can see all of it just by panning around the display. So if I go back here and I choose settings, now I can scroll up and scroll down and I can get all the buttons. Perfect. There you go. That's pretty slick right there. Let's take it one step farther. All right, so what we've got going on the screen here is I have SSH'd into the uh, SSH address of the radio as root. And the first thing it wants me to do is fix all of the security flaws of having a well-known root password. So I'm going to change that over to my favorite password. And then it wants me to choose my default shell. I'm a big ZSH fan. And I pressed enter when I shouldn't have pressed enter. Please provide a username. And we'll do Steve, because that's who I am. We'll create a password. Please provide my real name. And it has detected my time zone. Set user language based on time zone. Yes. I want ENUS UTF-8. All right, so I want to log out. Let's get up to the top of the screen here, and let's change the username over to my username. And now we're logged in over SSH into our radio. This is pretty slick stuff. We have 0.98 gigabytes of memory. We have 128 gigs of storage, 117 gigs. It's a 128 gig card, but that is my SD card. So that's whatever size I wanted to put in. It's been up for 10 minutes. That's how long it's taken us to do this kind of stuff here. Let's see, do we have, we do have HTOP. All right, so host name is X6100. It is a four core machine. We're using 200 megs out of 1,000 megs. We have no swap space. The system is degraded because a bunch of jobs did not start running, but that's all stuff that can be fixed and probably will be fixed later on. What I need to do is I need to get WSJTX up and running. And would you look at that? Oh man, ah, we just booted up a radio, configured WSJTX, got an antenna on the air and made a contact. This is crazy. I sent him a plus six. I got back a plus zero. I am a nine call in Luck, Wisconsin. This is WB2BIN. So East Coast. Let me take a look at PSK Reporter real quick. And then I'll show you how I have this thing set up. I got to get, uh, got to get my tab over here so y'all can see it. It's a little off the screen. Let's uh, zoom out a bit. Look at this. This is ridiculous. This is a QRP radio. I've got it plugged into shore power. I can't see the power meter. I don't know if I'm set at five or 10 watts. I kind of don't care at this point. This is ridiculous. This is amazing. This is great. Look at these signal reports. Minus 21, minus 14, minus 14, minus 22. These are people hearing me. Minus 22. Let me clean this up a little bit and I will do just people who have sent, who I have sent to. Okay, let's do it the other way around. Just people I have received. I'm not bad. 
not bad at all. This is the QRP guys tri-band vertical. I built this antenna on the channel a while back. It is a vertical antenna with four ground radios. It's set for 20 meters right now. And we are hearing pretty well and we are transmitting pretty well. Let me get rid of this screen here. Let me log this contact. I'll show you the settings that I have for configuration right now. I have the radio plugged in to itself over USB, like I mentioned before. That enables this thing to see itself as a USB device. I'm going to go into settings, and yeah, it's a little slow, but I don't care. This is amazing. All right, my call KM9G, my grid EN35. Under radio, this is the thing you want to see that's important. Hamlib net rig control running on localhost 127.001, set it to cat. Don't worry about this transmit audio source thing. It was at front mic, I left it at front mic. The mode is none, um, split operation is none, and we test cat. And hey, look at that, it's green. You kinda already knew that because it was working. Test PTT, it goes red because we're in PTT. I click it again to turn the PTT off and it goes off, slowly but surely. Patience. I just turned it back on again. All right, audio. These are the sound devices that you want to use for now. HW colon card equals device comma dev equals zero. And then output is sys default colon card equals device. And what else does this thing have on it? Let's get out of WSJTX and get some processing power back. All right, so accessories. I don't know where it pops all these things in, but they are there. Internet. FL Digi, FL Rig, FL Arc, they all went into the internet folder for some reason. That's the uh, default. JSA call and WSJTX. And that looks like it so far, but this is just your basic run of the mill Linux box. Let me go into terminal real quick and let's do sudo apt install joe, which is my favorite text editor. And it's unable to locate it because I need to do sudo apt update first because it doesn't know anything about the packages in the package repository. So this has come a long way. Yesterday when I tried the 002 beta, I had to do a bunch of wizardry and trickery in order to get the, uh, the QT app, the radio display app, running in the background so that I could do WSJTX and I could receive only, I couldn't transmit. Since yesterday, Lynx has been able to get this thing to work where when you hold down the number two button at boot up, it automatically runs the QT app in the background. You can't see it on the radio. And then you can do cat control and you can do audio over the USB loopback that we've got set up. Got the repositories downloaded and indexed. Let's install a text editor. We're kind of at the basic stage where I could do a 10 print program, but we're making progress. This is a lot farther along than we were the last time we did this. This is amazing. This is crazy. So now I can have my logbook running. I can have WSJTX running. I can have my radio running and I can do all kinds of radio stuff. I don't need a paper logbook in the field anymore. I don't need a separate computer in the field anymore. I just need this. I don't even need an internet connection. Once the clock is set, this thing's got a clock battery in it. This is great. There is a video right over here I think you will enjoy next. Thanks for being awesome. We'll see you in the next one.